turn with me to the New Testament Gospel according to St. Matthew, chapter 9. Matthew, chapter 9. want to just thank our music ministry this morning. Praise the Lord. They sound like they were ready to cut an album today. So good to see Sister Young with us this morning. Thank God for her presence, as well as Sister Carol Hadley and portions of her family. It's good to see Sister Hadley, and thank God for Sister Caldwell being here this morning, continuing to continue to lift her up in prayer. And we're just blessed that uh, Sister Alex could be here with us today. Amen. We've been praying for her, and God has given her the strength to be here this morning. Yeah. And we thank God for all that he is doing. Matthew chapter 9. <clears throat> I want to begin reading from the ninth verse. Out of the King James, it reads, And as Jesus passed forth from thence, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the receipt of custom. And he said unto him, follow me. And he arose and followed him. And it came to pass as Jesus sat at meat in the house, behold, many publicans and sinners came and sat down with him and his disciples. And when the Pharisees saw it, they said unto his disciples, why eateth your master with publicans and sinners. But when Jesus heard that, he said unto them, They that be whole need not a physician, but they that are sick. But go ye and learn what that meaneth. I will have mercy and not sacrifice, for I am not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Amen. You may be seated. I want to use as a subject line for this particular passage, guess who's coming to church? Guess who's coming to church. In 1967, Sidney Portier, Tracy Spencer, and Catherine Hepburn starred in a highly provocative film entitled Guess Who's Coming to Dinner. And in the film, uh, Tracy and Hepburn's white daughter uh, brings home to her parents uh, her black fiance, uh, Sidney Poitier, uh, to meet her parents for the first time. And uh, the parents had raised their daughter to be an independent thinker. Uh, they raised her, if you will, not to see color or to embrace uh, racial inequality or bigotry. Uh, yet, when their white daughter brings her black fiance in the home for dinner, uh, her liberal and progressive-minded parents uh, were not at all thrilled. Uh, the daughter uh, had taken things far beyond her parents' comfort zone. Uh, they, they never envisioned a day 
when their daughter would bring home a black fiance. And to add insult to injury, uh, Sidney Portier's parents uh, show up at the house of their soon to be in-laws uh, to make for one big, uncomfortable, and tense semi-family reunion. Uh, as you watch the film, you learn that the fathers, they are lockstep set against uh, their child, their children marrying one another. But as, as the film unfolds, you begin to see that uh, the mothers, uh, they begin to see and sense something different. Uh, that the father's prejudices uh, prevent them from seeing. Uh, the mothers begin to understand and appreciate uh, that even though life will be difficult uh, for this family, that ultimately, Love conquers all. Uh, that even though they will have to deal with a society uh, that still sees a race as a hurdle, as an obstacle to overcome, uh, that love ultimately conquers all. Love conquers all bigotry. Love conquers all Hatred, love conquers all prejudice and injustice and ridicule and scorn and persecution and malice and violence and gossip and bitterness. Uh, whatever the ill is, love conquers all. The film helps us to appreciate the fact that love bears all things. Love believes all things. Love hopes all things. Love endures all things. Love never fails. Love, brothers and sisters, looks beyond our faults and sees our needs. Guess who's coming to church? Jesus, my brothers and sisters, he is the personification of this all-conquering love. Uh, in a culture uh, that sought to build walls to keep some people out, and in a culture that exalted others and cared for others uh, while degenerating uh, others, uh, Jesus personifies a matchless love. Uh, Jesus, he personifies the unconditional love of God. Uh, with a tender touch, Jesus healed a leper. With caring compassion, uh, he revived a centurion servant, a centurion who had a sick servant who was filled with palsy. Uh, in love, he restored a demon-possessed man. He shared the good news to all within his reach. Anyone who was willing to call upon his name and believe in him in love, he reached out toward them with salvation and fellowship, with wholeness, restoration, reconciliation, because love conquers all. And as we look at and consider uh, the text before us this morning, uh, we see that uh, this indeed is the case in the life of this man, Matthew, uh, who the master encounters. Uh, when you uh, read the text, you see that uh, Jesus is in Capernaum. Uh, 
uh, this crossroads city of the ancient world, this international highway, if you will, uh, from Egypt to Damascus. And Jesus, while in Capernaum, he encounters this man whose name is Matthew. And as we consider uh, the Savior's call of Matthew, uh, we discover in the text that Matthew, uh, he has a problematic past that is preventing him from his preordained present. Uh, he has a problematic past that is preventing him from fulfilling his preordained purpose. Uh, Matthew, his name, brothers and sisters, means gift of God. Uh, but because of some bad decisions that Matthew had made in the past, uh, we see him living life beneath his preordained purpose. Matthew, the Bible tells us, uh, was a tax collector. Uh, because of his chosen occupation, uh, Matthew, brothers and sisters, he made uh, the Jewish top three list of the most reviled sinners worst of the worst. Uh, you know, as, as humans, we have a tendency uh, to categorize sins uh, in order to make ourselves feel better. You see, I may lie, but I haven't killed anybody. So, so I'm not as bad a sinner as the murderer. I may gossip and backbite, uh, but at least I'm not a woman of the night. So, so I'm, a better, I'm a better sinner than she is. I, I may lust after, but uh, as of yet, I have not committed adultery physically, so I'm better than he or she who has. We, we have a tendency, brothers and sisters, to classify and to stack rank sin. But in the eyes of God, sin is sin. And all sin leads to death. But for Matthew, he, he represented one of the worst of sinners in all of Jewish society. Within uh, the Jewish culture, uh, you, you would not want to be classified as a leper. Within the Jewish culture, you would not want to be identified as a prostitute. Within that culture, you would never want to be identified, recognized as a tax collector. And when you think about it, uh, that tax collector, he may have been uh, the most hated of all the three. Because... Lepers uh, involuntarily contracted disease, the disease. No one uh, purposely tries to contract leprosy. It was involuntary. Uh, the prostitute, perhaps uh, she was only or he was only doing what was needed in order to try to survive and stay alive. But for this tax collector, uh, his was a voluntary position. Uh, this tax collector, he went to Rome and he paid the highest bid in order to obtain the job. They, they didn't just uh, pass out applications for tax collectors. Uh, you had to go and place a bid to become a tax collector. And so Matthew voluntarily went and cast his bid so that he could become a tax collector there in that city of Capernaum. He voluntarily stepped into the job role. He willfully, brothers and sisters, became a traitor to his nation. 
He willfully extorted his own people for a selfish gain. Matthew had made a decision a long time ago that prevented him from being the gift of God that he was called to be and all he provided for his people, for his family, for the nation was nothing but grief because of a past decision that he made. You think about it as a tax collector. He was hated. He was loathed. He was lonely. Think about it. Uh, he was a tax collector. Uh, his family could not brag on him. His mother and father, they could not talk about his accomplishments uh, with their friends. Uh, within the Jewish society, uh, Matthew was considered a Benedict Arnold. Uh, the religious community rejected him. He was barred from all religious activity because of a decision that he made in the past. And there are some folk who the church will not accept simply because of some decisions they have made in the past. That there's some folk that we don't want to sit down beside us because some of the decisions that they made last night still smells on their body. That there's some folk that we don't want in the Lord's house. If we be honest with ourselves, we move away from them because of decisions that they have made in the past. But when you look at the text, just look and see who's coming to dinner. Look and see who's coming to church. I, I, I love to examine this call of this this derelict of society. Because as Jesus is walking uh, the boulevard there in Capernaum, uh, he, he sees Matthew at his exchange table. But, but, he, but the Bible says that Jesus simply saw him. That, that's beautiful. That, that Jesus saw him. Because, brothers and sisters, all the people could see was his problematic past. But Jesus could see his promising potential. All the people could see is what Matthew had become. But Jesus looked beyond his fault and could see what Matthew could be in Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. All the people could see was that Matthew was a traitor. But Jesus could see that Matthew could be a testimony. All the people could see is that Matthew was an extorter. Uh, but Jesus could see that Matthew one day would be an exalter of Christ. All the people could see is that Matthew was a betrayer. But Jesus saw that he could be a blesser. All the people could see is that Matthew was a sinner, but Jesus could see that Matthew could be sanctified. All the people could see is that Matthew was an apostate, but Jesus could see that Matthew would one day be an apostle to the Christian faith. Aren't you glad that Jesus can see more in you than the world can see? Jesus saw him. He saw him. He saw past his problematic past and saw the great potential that was resident within Matthew, that he could truly be the gift of God. He could live up to his full God-given potential in Christ Jesus. You think about it, brothers and sisters. Most employees, they are highly hesitant uh, to hire individuals with severe criminal records. On, on most job applications, uh, the, the question will be asked, are you guilty? Have you ever been convicted of a felony? And if you lie on that application and HR finds out, you will soon 
be fired. And if you tell the truth on that application, chances are most likely you're not going to get hired. But aren't you glad this morning that we serve a God who willingly hires those who have criminal records? Aren't you glad this morning that we serve a God who hires people with problematic pasts? Aren't you glad that God hires people who have spiritual felony records? I'm glad this morning that I serve a God who's willing to hire me even though I may have spiritual warrants, even though I may be a repeat offender. God will still hire you. Just ask Abraham. He was a liar, but God hired him. Ask Moses. He was a murderer, but God hired him. Ask Jacob. He was a thief, but God hired him. Ask Rahab. She was a prostitute, but God hired her. Ask Peter, he was a thug, but God hired him. As Paul, he was a persecutor, but God hired him. I don't know what your sin is, but God knows what your sin is. You haven't always been who you are today. You haven't always acted like you act today. You once was a thug. You was once out in the street. You was once a liar. You was once a fornicator, but God hired you. God hired you in spite of your speckled past. God hired you despite your indeficiencies. God hired you. God hired you. He looked beyond your faults and he saw, he saw your need. I don't know why. He came to love me so, but he looked beyond my fault and saw my need. I'll forever lift my eyes to Calvary to view the cross where Jesus died for me. How marvelous the grace that caught my falling soul. He looked. He looked beyond. He looked beyond my faults and he saw, he saw my needs. Aren't you glad this morning that God sees more in us than the world sees? He sees the potential of what we are purposed to be fulfilled in him. Jesus saw him. I want you to appreciate and this is somewhat of a parenthetic principle because I don't want to be too long this morning. But I want you to notice that when Jesus called Matthew, that Matthew left all to follow Jesus. Jesus called, Matthew left all. If, if you go out and read uh, this uh, passage of scripture from uh, Luke's accounting in chapter 5 verse 28 he specifically says that Matthew left all and followed Jesus and perhaps brothers and sisters one of the major reasons that so many of us struggle to follow Jesus is because we want to bring with us our worldly occupation we want to bring with us our worldly desires, our worldly propensities, our worldly thoughts patterns. We want to have our cake and eat it too. But the Bible clearly says that you cannot serve two masters. That you will eventually find yourself loving one and despising the other. That if, in fact, like Matthew, we are to follow Christ to our full potential, like Matthew, we too must deny ourselves 
take up our cross and follow Jesus daily. So the question still resonates. It's still pertinent for the day. Is your all on the altar of sacrifice laid? Your heart, does the spirit control? You can only be blessed and find peace and sweet rest as you yield him your body and your soul. Matthew left all to follow Jesus. We serve a God who calls those who have a problematic past because he can see past that and understand the full potential of who we are when our lives are attached to him. Amen. 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 So we, we, we see uh, the Savior's call, but then as the passage transition, we also see the sinner's celebration. It, the scene shifts from the Savior's call to the sinner's celebration. Because once uh, Jesus is entered into Matthew's heart, uh, we see that Matthew then invites Jesus to his house. Uh, Matthew invites Jesus, but then he also invites his friends and his associates to meet his master. Because once Jesus touches your life, brothers and sisters, you want to share that good news with someone else. One of the truest evidences that Jesus has in fact and indeed touched your life is you will find yourself speaking to your friends and associates about Christ. It just makes sense, doesn't it? Because if you know a good mechanic and you have a friend whose car is broken down, you're going to tell them about your mechanic. If you know a good cardiologist and someone in your family suddenly begins to suffer from heart disease, you're going to tell them about that cardiologist. If you know a good lawyer and suddenly one of your friends is, is dealing with a courtroom situation, needs defense, you're going to tell them about that lawyer. And if Jesus has touched your life, uh, you can't help but celebrate, but then tell somebody else what Jesus has done in your life. If, if Jesus has touched you, you can't help, brothers and sisters, but go and share Christ with somebody else who you know is hurting, who you know is lost, who you know is suffering. If Jesus has helped you in your lostness, you can't help but go and share him with someone else. If Jesus showed up in your midnight, you can't help but go share with somebody else who is going through. If Jesus Jesus shielded you in the heat of the day. You can't help but go and tell somebody else that he is. He's a strong tower. That he's a way maker. That he's a bridge over troubled water. Uh, that he'll be a friend when you're friendless. Uh, he'll be a mother when you're motherless. He'll be a father for you when you're fatherless. He'll open doors that no man can shut. He'll pick you up and he'll turn you around. That he'll place your feet on solid ground. You got to go and tell somebody else about Jesus. I, I said I wasn't going to tell nobody, but I couldn't keep it to myself. What the Lord has done for me, you ought to have been there when he saved my soul. You ought to have been there when he wrote my name on the road. Let me tell you what happened. I started walking. I started talking. 
I started singing and I started shouting what the Lord has done for me. I don't know what he's done in your life, but I start to tell somebody this morning, he's done enough for me that I can tell the world what he's done for me. He came through in my darkest hour. That's what he's done for me. Every time I call him, he answers. That's what he's done for me. When I was down, he picked me up. That's what he's done for me. When I was weak, he gave me strength. That's what he's done for me. When I was lost, he came and found me. That's what he's done for me. I can tell the world. I can tell the world what he, what he has done. What he has done for me. Matthew, he, he, he invites Jesus to his house and, and, and he shares Jesus with his friends and his associates. But, but look what happens, that as Matthew is in his house celebrating with Jesus and his friends, Jesus' disciples, uh, church folk, the religious right got angry. The ecclesiastical elite got upset because they, they, the, the Pharisees show up and they begin to ask questions of Jesus' disciples. Why does your master eat with publicans and sinners? And Brothers and sisters, one of the things that was glaring for me is, as I studied this text is that it, it has to do with this matter of perception and what it is you see. Because in the earlier part of the passage, the text says that Jesus saw him. But when you look at what the text has to say about the Pharisees, the text says that the Pharisees saw it. Oh. Th therein lies the difference. Jesus saw him. The Pharisees saw it. They did not see them. They saw the problem. They did not see the people. They saw something that was horrific. Rather than seeing a hurting and lost humanity, they saw the sins. They saw the shortcomings. They saw pants that were hanging down. They saw skirts that were too tight. They saw jeans that were too tight. Uh, they smelled alcohol on people's breath. Uh, they smelled weed in people's clothing. They saw that he talked in an effeminate way. They saw it, but they never saw them. They saw it. They didn't see them because they saw it. It offended their religious sensibilities. They didn't see them. They saw their sin. They didn't see their humanity and their need of a savior. They simply saw it and it disgusted them. And one of the problems with the church is that we have too many Pharisees who see it rather than them. We have too many Pharisees who fail to see humanity and the lost and the hurting and their need for a savior because we're focused on it rather than them. And I'm, I'm going to use our official title 
brothers and sisters, if the new rising star, Missionary Baptist Church, is not careful in the name of religious decency, we're going to take on this same Pharisaic, hypocritical, condemning mindset. We, we must be careful, brothers and sisters, and understand that the doors of the church are always open to whosoever will. Jesus died for whosoever will. And as the Lord, as he adds to this church, as he adds to his church, He's going to add, brothers and sisters, people who are still struggling with addiction. He's going to add to this fellowship people who are still participating in fornication. He's going to add to this fellowship people who may be living yet still in adultery, people who may still be grappling with an LGBTQ lifestyle, people who cannot afford to dress like you dress, who cannot afford to do the things that you do, people who do not talk like you, folk who still will cuss you out. God is going to add folk to this church who still have issues, but God is working with their issues just like he's working with you and your issues. I don't care how long you've been sitting up in church, you still got issues. I don't care how cute your hat is, you still got issues. I don't care how long your dress is, you still got issues. You might have on a three-piece suit, but you still got issues. You still got issues, and God got you up. You still still got issues and the Lord still blesses you. You still got issues and he still open doors. You still got issues and he gives you mercy. You still got issues and he dispenses grace. You still got issues. You still got issues. God works through folk who still have issues. He works through people in spite of their issues. In spite of their idiosyncrasies, God is patient with each and every one of us. He's still at work in your life. You ought to be able to give him time to work in the lives of others. He, the master went to Matthew's house. Matthew wanted to share Christ with his friends and associates and church folk got mad about it. My, my, my. But look who's coming to dinner. Look who's coming to church. We, we, we looked at briefly the Savior's call. The sinner's celebration. But as the text continues to transition, uh, we see now the master's message. That upon hearing the Pharisees, Jesus delivers to them a message. He, he says to them, they that are whole need not a physician but they that are sick he tells them go then and learn what that means that I will have mercy and not sacrifice for I am come to call the I am, am not come to call the righteous but sinners to repentance that's the message, brothers and sisters. That, that, that it is not those who are whole who need a physician, but those who are sick. Those are the people that God expects us to go out and encounter. People who are still sick in their sins. That God expects us 
to dispense mercy rather than judgment. Mercy rather than criticism. Mercy, brothers and sisters, mercy suits each of our cases. We each stand in need of God's mercy. We must appreciate, brothers and sisters, that church is not a country club for the sanctimoniously segregated. Church, my brothers and sisters, is instead a hospital where terminally ill patients come to be treated by the great physician. Church, my brothers and sisters, is an operating room where Dr. Jesus is willing to see and treat all patients church my brothers and sisters it is God's courtroom where the guilty are assigned God's court appointed attorney and he argues the merits of the law before the righteous judge and the good news about this court appointed attorney is that he has never lost a case and, and 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 he closes every trial the exact same way first jesus goes to his client and he asks them this singular question do you trust your attorney do you put your faith in me? And for each client that says yes, Jesus then turns and approaches the bench. And he says, your honor, father, my client enters a plea of guilty. My client is guilty of all the charges that stand against him. But Father, based on the blood evidence that I left at the scene of the crime, my client, uh, I need you to let him go and let him off. She admits that she has fallen short, but there's some blood that was left at the scene of the crime. And it's not her blood, but it's my blood. And because my blood was shed for her sins, even though her life is messy, when you look at the scene of the crime, my blood covers up all of her sins. My blood covers up all of his sins. What can wash away my sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is that flow. It makes me white as snow. No other fountain. No, nothing but the blood of Jesus. If you look in your life, there's some crime scenes. If you look in your life, you have some sins. You're not perfect, but there's some blood at the crime scene. And it's not your blood. It's Jesus' blood on a cross. One dark Friday, he died didn't he die? But early, early Sunday morning, he got up with all power in his hands. I thank him for the blood. I thank him for the blood. The blood, it will never lose. The blood, it will never lose. The blood will never lose its power. I don't know about you, but I'm just standing beneath the blood. The blood cleanses me. The blood makes me whole. The blood gives me strength. The blood redeems me. The blood sanctifies me. The blood has justified me. I thank God for the blood. Is anybody in here can thank God for the blood? Are you covered by the blood? I know you got a past. I know you haven't always been perfect. I know you're not everything God wants you to be right now, but I thank him. I thank him. I thank him. Thank you. Thank you. Well, 
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the blood. Guess who's coming to church? Whosoever will, let them come. God bless you. The doors of the church are open. was shared for you it hasn't lost its power it still has the power to say give Christ your life today Strength. 